and welcome to Rising. I'm happy to be back in the studio with Brianna Joy Gray. Hello. Hello. Did you enjoy your little lark away from home? Uh, I did. I participated in a debate at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill, and then I took a very early flight here this morning to get back in time for the show. Oh, the I dedication to the craft. Better in person, right? <laughs> always. Just always couldn't leave grumpy. you alone. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. It was empty up here. All right. Well, we've got updates on the Israel-Palestine news. Take it away. Uh, well, yesterday, President Biden said the U.S. will not back a ceasefire until Ga uh, in Gaza until Hamas held hostages are released. Let's watch. And MSNBC's Katie Tour pressed the White House on the actual status of those hostages while interviewing administration spokesperson John Kirby yesterday. Let's watch. Um, what are you expecting in regards to the other American hostages and the other hostages in general? Is there anything that you can tell us about negotiations and whether there is an expectation that they will be released at some point? What I can tell you is that we are very hard uh, at work trying to get them released, particularly our American citizens that we know are still being held hostage. Uh, there are active communications going on uh, as you and I speak. I want to be careful that I don't get into too much detail or context about them, lest I say something that makes it harder for us to achieve their release. But we are working on this very, very hard. Later, Tur grilled Kirby on the question of American citizens trapped in Gaza. Let's watch that. What can you tell us about the status of the Americans who are who were in Gaza, the American Palestinians visiting family, the ones who have not been able to get out? We're working on that very, very hard, too. I wish I could tell you that at such and such a time that gate's going to get open and they're going to the get on out. What's but the whole We up? are working. There are there are regional concerns, regional uh, security concerns that we're trying to work through. We've got a uh, Ambassador Satterfield, the special envoy, who's whole job is to get the humanitarian assistance in and to see if we can get some of those Americans out. He's working it on the ground as we speak. We hope that we'll have some re resolution soon so that we can get those folks safe passages out, get them on their way, get them home. Uh, they say that they don't feel like the American government is prioritizing them. They see the, the, the planes out of Israel. They see the ships out of Israel to get Israeli Americans out. They don't feel the same about uh, their situation. Yeah. Listen, I understand the fear, the anxiety that they're having right now. I, I, I can't say that I, I blame them as many of them are sitting down there at the Rafa crossing waiting for that gate to open up. Uh, I understand that what they're going through. We understand what they're going through. And that's why we're working it really, really hard. Overnight, two more hostages were released by Hamas amid intense negotiations in a deal brokered by Egypt and Qatar. Nurek Cooper, 79, and Yochevit Lifshitz, 85, are now safely in Israeli custody, though their husbands still remain held by Hamas. One of the women, 85-year-old Lifshitz, described her kidnapping as hell, but also described her captors as gentle, even shaking hands with one as she left. The image has since taken social media in Israel, in Israel rather, by storm. Meanwhile, according to reporting in the Wall Street Journal, talks over the release of any larger group of hostages, those talks are held up. Israel is refusing to meet the group's demands for fuel to be included in humanitarian aid to the region. Israel believes the fuel will just end up in the hands of Hamas. Hamas. Now, all this comes as airstrikes continue to pummel the Gaza Strip. Yesterday, the IDF confirmed it had struck a Hamas target inside a refugee camp. A Gaza Health Ministry spokesperson later claimed women and children were killed in that strike. Okay. <clears throat> There's a lot here. One, I want to start with uh, John Kirby's response to Katie Tour about the question of whether Palestinian Americans are being treated differently than Israeli Americans. When she asked why they're not able to be let out of Gaza, he referenced regional security concerns, which begs the question, what are the security concerns around American Palestinians sure. trapped in Gaza? And two, when pressed, alluded to the idea that we needed to get the gate open. Now, the Biden administration has been making a lot of noise and singing pra its praises about the fact that, uh, I believe it was Sunday night, the first humanitarian trucks came in 
to Gaza from Egypt. So this idea that the gate isn't open seems to be facially disproved by the fact that we are now, that Gaza is now able to receive some insufficient, but some humanitarian aid. So the question is, when that gate opens to let those trucks through, what is precluding the American citizens that are trapped in Gaza from walking out of that gate? Well, and it's hard to know what the answer to that is, because Kirby gave a complete non-answer to that question. So we have no idea why um, the administration is not manifesting greater um, haste in taking care of that. It, it does not, frankly, seem to be a priority at all. Yeah, yeah. So I, I didn't want to uh, ask you about this this really controversial moment. Uh, there's a video of it as well, an interview that the, um, the elder hostage, Lifshitz, gave where they specifically asked her why she shook uh, the uh, Hamas individual's hand. Uh, the first, the, the image in the video of her being released went viral because of the handshake. And then they followed up and asked her in this interview, well, well why did you do it? And she went on to say it's because she was treated well. They seemed to be very prepared. They provided shampoo and all the things that I think she said, quote, women would need. And this, for obvious reasons, is being perceived as an, an optics boondoggle for Israel and has been very controversial and been all over the social media, apparently, in Israel in particular. What, what do you make of the optics of that? Well, I think the detail that they're still holding her husband hostage is pretty important. Um, I might say, nice things about my captors, too, under such a mm -hmm. situation in, in hopes that um, that uh, if, if, if I had a loved one who was still being held, what wasn't going to be punished in some reciprocal nature based on what I said. It's, of course, possible that they treated this hostage well. It's uh, We don't really know the conditions that the hostages are being held in. Maybe they're being treated well. Obviously, we have um, knowledge of and images of the the horrific Conditions of the capturing of the uh, the the act of capturing we and we you know, I've seen we've seen the there's been reporting on you know Hamas's um, like operations manual which is to like to kill hostages that will be difficult and to really just want to keep um, women and children and people who are quiet and easy to deal with which maybe described um, this elder pair of ladies but uh, you know I don't I don't think um, anyone needs to feel like embarrassed that they said nice things about their captivity, given that it's an ongoing situation and they might not have wanted to put anyone else's lives at risk. But per perhaps their situation was um, not as horrible as others' situation, or you know, perhaps what they're saying is true. But I, I don't think I wouldn't read into it more than that at this juncture. I do think the reason why it's perceived to be embarrassing is because there has been this really strong narrative um, coming out of. Uh, the Israel IDF, saying that uh, the way that Hamas treats its captives and the way that it is conducting its war is particularly brutal and barbaric, and therefore justifies some of the techniques that the IDF has been using, including collective punishment, which, as we discussed, is a is a um, violation of the Geneva uh, Convention. So, I mean, there's there's this way that Israel's approach toward Gaza only is sort of justified in the public imagination if it seems like it's proportional to what um, Hamas is doing. And if there is, this is only one isolated incident, obviously, as you've pointed out, and there could be reasons why the hostages would want to be, let's say, sympathetic so that their loved ones are still captured or treated well. But they're not all saying this, right? right. This one woman had this particular story about how she was treated, and there is some question as to whether or not that starts to shift public opinion, not in favor of obviously taking people hostage, but against some of the more um, aggressive approaches that the IDF has taken to Gaza, including not wanting—there has been a lot of conversation about whether or not they would be willing to trade fuel for hostages, because the IDF says it would be used for Hamas's purposes, firing rockets, and people who are trying to administer humanitarian aid in Gaza are saying, we need this to run incubators, we need this to run the hospitals. And is, it, is that, again, justified? Is it collective punishment to withhold fuel? These are questions that are still yeah. being um, debated. On I mean, the look, I, I certainly I hope they're treating the hostages that they did not, like, tie together and burn to death. Are, I, I hope the ones they, that Hamas did not do that to are being treated well, and maybe they are, because Hamas is trying to actually get something out of this arrangement to, you know, work out, um, obviously, if it, it eliminates or mistreats all the hostages, that actually might give Israel more incentive to just say, well, screw it, we're going to continue trying to 
destroy Hamas because we can't. We, there are no hostages. Yeah, that, that is so, a concern as well. There's been so a lot treating of treating them badly does is not maybe even a good tactical no, strategy I, for I, Hamas. Not out of the kindness yeah. of their hearts, but just because it doesn't. Yeah, I think you. you I think you are that. right to point to the real risk, and this is some a concern that hostage families have raised in Israel that uh, the IDF's approach here could end up killing their family members. Um, before there's any negotiation that's uh, wrangled here. Now, per the Times of Israel, an Israeli defense minister remarked to others recently that Israel permitted humanitarian aid into the Gaza Strip because the country was, in quote, no place to challenge U.S. demands. As Dr. Trita Parsi pointed out on Twitter, Biden officials say the U.S. can't make Israel agree to de-escalate or to a ceasefire, yet Israel's defense minister says that Israel is in no position to say no to the U.S. when it makes demands. It seems Biden simply doesn't want a de-escalation. What do you make of this, of this reasoning here? Well, that, that's actually a good, good to hear from the Israeli officials that they do weigh U.S. judgment yeah. because they know how reliant they are for all the weapons we're sending, and that would— you know why? Why wouldn't President Biden then use that leverage to actually um, avoid a situation where the U.S. is in a major um, uh, confrontation, possibly involving ground troops, with uh, several major Muslim countries and Muslim groups? That's that is just absolutely contrary to our national security interests. And it looks like we do have an opportunity uh, again not to. Uh, from my perspective and probably from the Biden administration's perspective, not necessarily to stop or thwart um, Israel in its effort to root out Hamas, but to have a broader conflict that gets out of control where we end up in another endless war in the Middle East scenario that leaves no one better off. That, that seems absolutely like something the American people want to avoid, like something the federal government should ought to want to avoid. Um, I mean, Biden has been around <laughs> in government for all of these past failed efforts to bring peace to specific countries in the Middle East um, by having heavy U.S. involvement. Is he really up for another one of these? How could well, he be? That, I mean, but that seems increasingly likely. If it is the case that Israel is listening to the United States of America, then it really throws some suspicion on this inside-outside strategy that the Biden administration has been telegraphing, where they say, well, we want to publicly support Israel, but trust us, behind the scenes, we're, uh, we're uh, uh, urging restraint. Um, uh, uh, Yonan Tuval, who is, a, a, as a reporter, he's also with the Israeli Institute for Regional Foreign uh, Policies, he tweeted out uh, this morning that U.S. officials confirmed to me that the key reason for IDF ground invasion delay is U.S. request to complete preps for a broader conflict, which suggests the delay is because not we're trying to de-escalate, but we're trying to get ready to get more involved, which is very concerning for those of us who, to your point, Robbie, have seen how this has gone in the past and are very skeptical that there's going to be a good outcome here. Yeah, it, it feels like we're being like we're slow walking into another major Middle East conflict that heavily involves the U.S. And people are just kind of, our, our leaders are just kind of resigned to it without thinking through what the broader implications. And we've just been down this road so many times. And there's clearly very little appetite for it among the American public. I don't see, I don't hear people, I hear a mix certainly a mix of opinions about the situation in the Middle East and where your sympathies lie. I don't, you know, correct me, viewers, if you think I'm wrong, but I don't hear out, you know, out in the, the broader, in our, in our country, our fellow citizens, I don't hear them clamoring for U.S. troops to be sent to Middle East because of this conflict. No, but I also don't think that Biden is confused about where public opinion lies on this. I don't think he's naive. I, I think that the objectives of, for all the critique that's happened over the last few years with the deep state and Donald Trump and he's being attacked and the military industrial complex, this is the moment where all of that hmm. energy, I think, which is sincerely felt, but it's perhaps applied in areas that aren't as relevant to the public interest, need to find, a, a, need to land here. It has always been the interest of the blob to do wars. We have seen um, unusual whales has been reporting on the number of Congress members who are personally profit profiting from this conflict. Our, the only socialism that we have 
one of the few forms of socialism that we have in the United States of America is our military system. And the U.S. dollars that are now flowing extremely freely to weapons manufacturers. In fact, our own representatives in the State Department and elsewhere are making the case that people shouldn't mind $100 billion going out in these military aid packages, because ultimately it comes back to Americans in the form of money I, to defense contractors. As you know, I'm no fan of socialism. <laughs> right. Well, so I, the, what the, I'm trying to say is that but but Joe Biden is facing is up for re-election. Yep. He's going to be facing an opponent who we're not absolutely sure who that is, but very likely to be Donald Trump, who might be saying different things about foreign. We don't I don't really know. We haven't heard a tremendous amount from him on this subject yet. Obviously, you can parse what his past statements and past policy was toward Israel, but might be saying different things about how much intervention there should be with the U.S. So I'm just saying that maybe um, Joe Biden should listen to what the American people are saying for his own narrow political interest. Right. Well, Ron Klain uh, quote tweeted um, a tweet by Walid Shaheed the other day, where Walid Shaheed, uh, he's for Justice Democrats, um, Muslim American, pointed out how many Muslim Americans are saying they won't vote for Biden uh, because they're so frustrated about how he's handling this crisis, including a lot of voters in Michigan, which is a key state with a large Muslim population that he needs to win. And Ron Klain, Biden's senior advisor, says, he, like, basically, I don't want to misquote him, but he was basically like, whatever, then they'll get Trump. And if that's the attitude the Biden administration is having to disaffected voters, it's not going to look very good for him uh, next year. All right, stick around. We have more Rising for you right after this.